self-control, big issue, big issue in the world around us as well as in Christian circles these days, and that's interesting, isn't it? It was in the 1960s, a, a psychologist called Walter Michel tested four-year-old children for self-control. <laughs> and he devised a thing, which I'm sure you like the sound of, called the marshmallow test. Ah, see, all bright eyes now. The children were given a marshmallow each, put in front of them, and they were told they can eat it now, any time they want, but if they waited 15 minutes, they would be given an extra marshmallow. And this wasn't referred to the uh, NSPCC or any other child protection body. Uh, it, was, uh, it was research, it was science, so that's all right then, isn't it? But the interesting thing is that follow-up studies showed the results correlated well with these children's success levels in later life if they showed self-control at that point. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. And years later, Dr. Michelle reached out to the participants of his study who were then in their 40s. And he found that those who showed less self-control by taking the single marshmallow in that first study were more likely to develop problems with relationships, with stress and with drug abuse in later life. And then there were reviews of that, because that was an interesting piece of research, and the reviews concluded that self-control is correlated with various positive life outcomes, like happiness, adjustment, and various positive psychological factors. So here we are, coming to the conclusion of this part of our look at the Christian experience of God, where we've been looking at what the Holy Spirit does to us as he indwells us, as he makes us like himself because he's living in us because we're having contact with him as we walk with him he transforms us into his better likeness and this last one in that series is self-control that part of the series is self-control which he puts into you as you walk with him as you walk with him that last bit of course is key to it in the Journal of Biblical Counselling, Edward Welch writes like this. As the Hebrews were promised the land, but had to take it by force, one town at a time, so we are promised the gift of self-control. Through all this fruit of the Spirit. In the dream. So we are promised the gift of self-control, but we also must take it by force. We see the way the, the Israelites had to take the land that they were promised. John Piper's got some very good stuff on this on the Desire and God website. There's an article there. The very concept of self-control implies a battle between a divided self. It implies that our self produces desires we should not satisfy but instead control. We should deny ourselves, take up our cross daily, Jesus says, and follow him, Luke 9.23. Daily, our self produces desires that should be denied or controlled. It's the Christian way. That path, says Piper, that leads to heaven is narrow and strewed with suicidal temptations to abandon the way. Therefore, Jesus says, strive to enter through the narrow door, Luke 13, 24. And he goes on. The Christian way of self-control is not just say no. You've heard that slogan, haven't you? You know, just say no. That's not the Christian way, says Piper. The problem is with the word just. You don't just say no. You say no in a certain way. You say no by faith in the superior power and pleasure of Christ. It's not a matter of that which lies within ourselves in a Christian context. The control of the self doesn't come simply from myself because myself doesn't want to control myself. Does that make sense? And Piper really quite helpfully concludes the article like this. Fundamental to the Christian view of self-control is that it is a gift. It is the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And then he quotes Galatians. How do we strive against our fatal desires? Paul answers, I labour striving, and then he says the Greek word, according to his power which mightily works within me. It's Colossians 1.29. He agonises, says Piper, by the power of Christ, not his own. Similarly, he tells us, and he quotes the verse we're looking at here in Romans 8, 13. If by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. If by the Spirit. And then he quotes Zechariah 4, 6. Not by might nor by power, but by my Spirit, says the Lord of hosts. 
We must be fierce, says Piper. Yes, but not by our might. The horse is made ready for the day of battle, but the victory belongs to the Lord. Proverbs 21, 31. And how does the Spirit produce this fruit of self-control in us? By instructing us in the superior preciousness of grace, enabling us to see and savour all that God is for us in Jesus. And then he quotes Titus 2. The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to men. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and live upright lives in this present evil age, and so on. Now, none of what Pope Piper says is remotely contestable. It's absolutely true. And it brilliantly puts the, the broader biblical perspective to the three verses we're looking at here briefly today. And that's why I've spent as much time with what he's got to say by way of introduction. They are utterly relevant to our culture, these things, which is absolutely addicted to control. Our society is full of control freaks. We are control freaks if we are people of our age and culture. But is utterly unable to control itself. Control freaks, they can't control themselves. A society that justifies personal indiscipline by saying that it's wrong that we should be told to control ourselves. We live in a society that says, do what you want. It is right because you want it. And scripture is directly opposed to that. That, that directly crashes into Romans 8.13. And it crashes into it at this point, really, the very first part of verse 13. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation. Thank